the more I think of what I did, what I proposed, the more I understand myself, much more as a thinker and, and a kind of epistemologist proposing a critical way of, of thinking and a critical way of teaching, of knowing to the teachers in order for them to work differently with the students. in Moira de Sauda during the Great Depression. Moira de Sauda was a slum outside of Recife, Brazil. Root housing in places like that are still a feature of the country to this day. During the Depression, he grew up in a house with no ceiling and no running water. He stole chickens to feed his family as a boy. At that time, my own grandfather was born. He remembered his household struggling to get food when he was small. When he grew up, he provided for his own family by enlisting in the army. He was sent to Korea to serve the interests of the American government, which he would spend the rest of his life telling anybody who would listen could never be trusted. This is actually sort of a family thing. When my ancestors came from Ireland, they gained respectability despite discrimination against the Irish at the time by working for the military to oppress the indigenous peoples of North America. Civilization actually has pretty bloody hands in general when you look at how often it's built on the backs of the oppressed by oppressors, despite the way it tends to be recorded and thought of. I, of course, was introduced to Paulo Freire in a college class where his works were assigned reading. I had heard of him in my hilariously excessive decade as an undergrad before that, occasionally in spheres of radical leftists and professors in the social sciences. That all had me prepared for something much less extremist, epistemic, and general. That was because of experiences and phenomena which I will discuss later. What I've since learned is that Freire was the head of education for the Brazilian government, selected by the newly democratically elected João Galera. Freire had a plan backed up by a staggering mastery of Marxist thought, philosophy, law, and social theory. Before he could enact his plans, however, the fear of oppressive forces of losing power under the socially progressive political party in Brazil led a coup d'etat overthrowing João Galera and establishing a military junta. Freire was imprisoned, interrogated, and eventually exiled. Subsequently, he wrote the ideas he'd had for teaching and culture in Brazil into Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It is clear from his work that his experiences in Brazil and his life there very much his inspiration and at the heart of his work. Paulo Ferreira inspired future pedagogy theorists such as Bell Hooks, who wrote... Which one is this? I keep thinking it's the love one. It's not love. Teach you to transgress. And Earl's Cannon? I just forgot Gannon's name. Kevin? Caleb? Horn? Kevin Gannon. Yeah. Radical Hope by Kevin Gannon. And historian Kevin Gannon. Wait, why am I talking about the story now? Bell Hooks grew up in the post-segregation South and spent her career developing pedagogy while she was surviving within the intersectionality of oppression by race and patriarchy. And Kevin Gannon, teaching history, which in the United States is overwhelmingly obsessed with war, was teaching from a realm of normalized oppression as well. Going back again to talk about my own family's history, there's actually a long line of people that are getting by through participating as victims of oppression themselves in service to governments doing the oppression of others as soldiers between principalities in the Holy Roman Empire or different sects of Irish leadership in the name of the English or between the or representing the interests of the English in conflicts between them and Scotland. 
a often oppressed underclass of people maintain their survival in various modes of oppression by representing the oppressors against other groups. This is a big part of how my family survived for generations. You can see things like that in the world order. Boston Warren show how these things are done in classrooms as well using Foucault, that it is the same standardization of the use of force, the same biopower that is used to oppress the victims of power by power in the classroom as it is in prisons or in conflict between countries or peoples. As Marx showed that the proletariat sells its humanity, its species being, in order to survive under capitalism, so too did my ancestors sell their humanity in order to help the oppressors sacrifice their own humanity, take humanity away from others, in order to build empires, to colonize, and to fight wars. A semi-human who pursues the process of othering human beings so as to devalue and typecast them has already lost his or her humanity to the extent that he or she cannot see humanity in others. The liberation of the oppressed is a liberation of women and men, not things. Accordingly, while no one liberates herself or himself by her or his own efforts alone, Neither is she or he liberated by others. Liberation, a human phenomenon, cannot be achieved by semi-humans. In any attempts to treat people as semi-humans, as in the case of white supremacy and patriarchy, only dehumanizes them. A semi-human, whose only concern is things and not people, can never, nor is he or she willing to, offer a form of literacy that leads to liberation and emancipation. We've always thought of our heroes as having to do with death and war. And, you know, when we think of Joseph Campbell and the whole idea of the heroic journey, it's rarely a journey that's about love. It's about, you know, deeds that have to do with conquering, domination, what have you. I think what's really tragic about education, particularly uh, at a higher level in our nation right now, is that it has become to be something that is about the marketplace so that there's a lot of repression that students begin to do um, because they want to prepare themselves for the marketplace, for you know, getting the money and getting the power and getting the status and getting the fame. You know, a lot of what I do in the classroom is to try to teach that kind of courage that allows you to speak freely. I'm a big Martin Luther King fan, especially of the later sermons. And when I go back, you know, in Strength to Love, he talks about standing in the shadows of fascism. And he talks so much about the importance of protecting free speech, our, our democracy, and yet people don't realize how radical much of what he was saying. I mean, he was talking about, we're going to see a day of terrorism, we're going to see all of these things. I mean, here's this man, for example, that most people remember by, you know, what is, what is a very poetic, uh, you know, I have a dream speech, but not by the deep, penetrating social and political analysis he had about imperialism and why because in a sense we censor that Martin Luther King even like a Martin Luther King holiday is constructed to to make him more palatable one of the ways that censorship takes in our culture is the censorship of manners where we assume that we gonna, we know who Ken Paulson is we know his opinions that he's going to take people assume oh bell hooks is a feminist these are the opinions that she's going to have and to me, that kind of compartmentalization and labeling is very, very anti, not just free speech, but the whole n sense of recognizing that as individuals, we can hold very different opinions about things. Part of what I hope for us as a nation, and particularly in our educational institutions, is that we will teach what I, I use in a phrase in my books, radical openness. Radical openness allows for the fact that you and I might totally disagree about some things. But there may be other things that we have a resonance and a harmony about. And when we compartmentalize each other in such a way, how do we hold those differing senses of who we are? Why do we expect that we're going to get together and talk about race and racism and not have perhaps anger, conflict, you know, when we don't expect that in the deepest areas of our lives, our intimate lives, we recognize conflict will be a part of 
trying to have a relationship with somebody who is not you. That on one hand, there were moments um, in our recent history as a nation where I felt truly frightened. You know, for the first time in my life, my mother called me and said, you must be really careful what you say when you get up on stages because you, you know, could be assassinated. We are a nation um, where many people f are afraid of free speech and, th and want to silence people. And if we cannot acknowledge that that will to silence is growing, that's what King meant when he talked about standing in the shadows of fascism. So on one hand, I experienced for the first time ever as a citizen of this nation feeling that I, had, I had, was taking grave risk in standing before audiences and saying the things that I believed. And at the same time, you know, I had audiences that were eager to hear, well, what do you think about this? Audiences of people who may or may not have agreed with me. So that's the paradox that we live within, uh, a society that is full of promise and possibility, and a society that, on the other hand, will close things down if people feel they need to to protect the lifestyles or the belief systems that they think are the only important belief systems. And I can't keep worrying about how the lighting looks stupid and I can't get the camera set up in a way where I can use the chroma key with the back wall. And then at time, I have to just get this shit done. So one of us was going to aim the camera at myself over the best. I want to talk about what I've been thinking of as actually existing classrooms. This is something I get from, um, I think, Noam Chomsky. Uh, although, it's very similar to a phrase that uh, Wendy Brown also uses. I'm not sure who they're referencing when they use it, or which of them may have originated the concept. It's usually in reference to capitalism, neoliberalism, artifacts of ideology, as opposed to the way that they are thought of ideologically, the actually existing objective forms, things that we are living with, as opposed to what people claim they are, or want it to be, or are trying to make it into, what have you. So I want to talk about classrooms in this way because we have a theoretical conception of classrooms which is sort of hollow and deliberately ignorant as a society. But there is a way that Paulo Freire in particular, but other theorists as well, describe the possibility of classroom, a neoplatonic classroom, an estuary of meaningful experience as opposed to what we have which is an indoctrination center. Actually, existing classrooms are prisons, essentially. In some cases, they're buildings on campuses that are literally originally designed to have been prisons. That, like, that's literally the case. They operate like office buildings because the concept of professionalism is being iterated upon and then people are being inculcated in it in the way that the schools operate. What's taught to some extent is the content of the discipline, facts, figures, vocabulary, names, dates, that sort of thing. But not only is that not like the part of education that's valuable, it's also nothing like the only thing that's taught because the way that the classroom works, the way that people teach, forms and informs in a lot of subtle ways. Basically, it instills cultural norms. Cultural norms that it instills are those of a particular pro-elite methodology. This is often referred to as the hidden curriculum. The norms of higher education are impressed upon students by their participation in the academy itself, in every college, in every department, in every room, in every institution. It polices customs, expectations, and attitudes toward ideology. These are the things that are being taught outside of the content of the discipline. The facts, figures, names, dates, etc. These all come of long-standing traditions of colonization, imperialism, privilege, and supremacy. And this is long after a lot of the ideas that those things used to represent in the academy have been discredited or abandoned. Practices, on the other hand, are still more or less the same as they were all the way back to Plato. The thing is, since higher education has been largely defunded, eroded, neoliberalized, transformed into debt-generating mechanisms, they offer less and less of the education which is valued by the likes of Hooks, Dewey, and Freire, and instead produce the worst possible form of dysfunctional capitalist norms. 
even devaluing graduates in the eyes of potential employers. This is despite the fact that higher education was denigrated in service to the job creator marketplace to begin with. In this way, again, we find that the inculcation of contemporary capitalism is sawing off the branches sitting on. That it's undermining itself in order to try to turn the university into a business. To make people who are thinking in administration of higher education think like they're running a business. Oregon State University, Boise State University where I came from, the University of California where Newfield was working, aren't even private schools. They're state institutions. Actually existing education is imposing the role of the subject of oppression upon students as a matter of course. Policed language under the guise of politeness, professionalism, and respectability silences dissent, mutes minorities, and undercuts meaningful interpersonal connections. That's the price of controlled and compelled speech. That's why actually existing classrooms are... It's still weirdly off balance. Like, that mic's way over there, and this one's like right up my ass, and yet somehow... The age of rationalism and the rise of capitalism brought with it a fundamental crystallization of worldviews. The ideological presumptions about things and people as simply resources to be harvested, used or destroyed. To make use of minerals, we tore them up from the ground. To make use of animals, we hunted them off into extinction for their skins, oil, and meat. To make use of people, our enslaved them, conquered them, made them lesser. Science. Knowledge often came at the cost of life. Insects were studied after the killing jar, which is still a symbol of scientific discovery to this day. To preserve plant specimens, they were crushed. To understand organisms, we studied corpses. For humanity, using resources, learning, and even teaching involved death. Thinkers of the past knew this. To them, study of the earthly realm was often by means of memento mores. To really understand something, the act of observation often comes at a price. It's no surprise that learning, and a place set up on this outmoded ideological fundament, would reduce the learner's instructors to mechanical use, remove the life from the classroom, leaving only the cold, dead remains of past harvests in the mind. The title for this chapter may strike you as a bit overwrought, if not downright bizarre, but its origins are less sinister than they seem. I'm drawing upon the imagery of a 19th century philosopher and theologian, Nikolai Frederick Severin, NFS, Grundtvig. Grundtvig was one of Denmark's most renowned polymaths and philosophers. A significant portion of his writings address education, ranging from critiques of the current guiding philosophies of higher education to advocating for specific pedagogies. What struck me most as I was skimming through some of this work was a scathing critique of the educational orthodoxy of his day. A curriculum centered on areas like classical languages and rhetoric was elitist, he believed, and of no relevance or use in the regular lives of most citizens. What was needed instead, Grundtvig argued, was a school for life. This type of institution would provide education in areas that would not only edify learners, but prepare them to be good citizens who contributed to the cultural growth and prosperity of Denmark. Rather than institutions that contributed to the life of the country, Grundtvig never one to skimp on the rhetorical firepower, dubbed them schools of death. This distinction was at the heart of the folk school movement that became a significant part of the Danish education. His call for an education that spoke directly to the lives and needs of ordinary citizens, a call that eschewed the then current model of higher education as irredeemably elitist and therefore alienating for most potential students, resonates quite profoundly with the present-day calls for improving access and inclusion in our institutions of higher education. It's all too easy for us to burn ourselves up with non-stop critique to the point where we're merely fighting for the sake of fighting and have turned ourselves into pedagogical nihilists. But it's just as easy to blithely float along on empty platitudes 
lulled like modern-day lotus eaters, sustained by inspirational quotes we find on Pinterest, telling us dreams can come true in the classroom. It's vital for us to effectively strike the balance between the two. We must be relentless critics of the current neoliberal fetish for schools of death, but we must always do so in the service of a larger vision of what instead could be, as Grunfi attempted to do with his calls for schools of life. It's easy to critique, but harder to build. Yet we owe it to ourselves and our students not only to point out the vast array of problematic areas of the higher educational landscape, but also to offer tangible and meaningful alternatives. Neither the language of critique nor the language of possibility is powerful enough on its own. Only working in tandem can they help us create a pedagogy grounded in radical hope. I still have no idea what's causing that horrible whining sound. Why did I ever start making YouTube videos in the first place? Ah. Anyway, what Gannon says, it's, well, it's easier said than done. What we're looking at right now is the current configuration of the correspondence principle. Or at least that's how I'm about to describe it. As Bullis and Gintis theorized, I wasn't going to keep theorized. Why is that in there? Hold on, I gotta fix this real quick. I mean, you don't care. You're not even gonna hear this because I'm gonna cut this part out because it's dumb. I'm doing dumb things right now, dumbly. As Bolas and Gintis have shown, the socioeconomic role of the student is regulated by higher education into the worker in the interests of capitalism. The current state of that capitalism is neoliberal capitalism, if anything, more ethically, socially, and experientially bankrupt than before. The education students' experience enforces fake tolerance while reproducing bigotry and follows what Frere calls the banking model of education. This empty version of education only offers a system by which the people in positions of oppressor oppress people below them. They instill the standards and customs of oppression, which prepares people to either operate within that system of oppression or to maintain position as the oppressed. The difference between being a victim of oppression and making sure that not only are you not likely to help victims of oppression, even if you are not directly one of them, but as my ancestors did, to work for the oppressor against the oppressed, rather than joining the oppressed against your oppressor. They cannot see that, in the egoistic pursuit of having as a possessing class, they suffocate in their own possessions and no longer are, they merely have. For them, having more is an inalienable right, a right they acquired through their own effort with their courage to take risks. If others do not have more, it is because they are incompetent and lazy, and worst of all, it is their unjustifiable ingratitude towards the generous gestures of the dominant class. Precisely because they are ungrateful and envious, the oppressed are regarded as potential enemies who must be watched. It could not be otherwise. If the humanization of the oppressed signifies subversion, so also does their freedom, hence the necessity for constant control. And the more the oppressors control the oppressed, the more they change them into apparently inanimate things. This tendency of the oppressor consciousness to inanimate everything and everyone it encounters, in its eagerness to possess, unquestionably corresponds with a tendency to sadism. The pleasure in complete domination over another person or other animate creature is the very essence of the sadistic drive. Another way of formulating the same thought is to say that the aim of sadism is to transform a man into a thing, something animate into something inanimate, since by complete and absolute control the living loses one essential quality of life, freedom. Sadistic love is a perverted love, a love of death, not of life. One of the characteristics of the oppressor consciousness and its necrophilic view of the world is thus sadism. As the oppressor consciousness, in order to dominate, tries to deter the drive to search, the restlessness and the creative power which characterize life, it kills life. 
More and more, the oppressors are using science and technology as unquestionably powerful instruments for their purpose, the maintenance of the oppressive order through manipulation and repression. The oppressed, as objects, as things, have no purposes except those their oppressors prescribe for them. Which of these are even the bad ones? Conscientious as thou. It is difficult to say, but it's also fun. Conscientious as thou. It's kind of like clown, except Portuguese and sociological. Pereira tried to keep the term conscientious as thou, um, along with a lot of like disturbingly sexist language is because uh, he wanted to talk the way the people he meant to be speaking to spoke. A big part of how oppression works, to have the oppressors tell the oppressed how to speak, what words they can use, which languages they should be speaking. This is a big thing with the British Empire and English, for example, which is why a lot of the Commonwealth speak English now, despite being, you know, Indian. I suspect the reason why he gave in is because Portuguese is still a colonizer language. At least Compared to English, it's probably six of one, half a dozen of the other, and um, conscientization is still reasonably difficult to say, so it's still, I don't know, pretentious enough to work. According to Freire, the oppressed must have the rights to enunciate their own words. Oppressors, opposers impress, impress? Oppressors impose their own, which are often ideologically hollowed out postmodern nonsense nowadays. Freedom, liberty, democracy, and efficiency, uh, while what they deliver is control, silence, corruption, and debt. Method uh, fetishization is commonplace um, and makes it difficult to have conversations about meaningful education. This was illustrated by Noam Chomsky. The notion that types of learning or methods in existing settings are to be the focus of education rather than the ends of criticality and consciousness. I don't actually remember why he was saying it. Anyway, there'll be more details about that at the end. Ferrer believed in education through communication. For Ferrer, communication is the central basis for education. In fact, he uses dialectical in kind of a weird way compared to most Marxists. He blends it with dialogue as though it's a natural thing in the world that we observe rather than a tool that we use to investigate how people talk about things, um, which is neat, actually. I kind of thought that was an eccentricity at first, but I think it's more about how he roots a social structure in communication. He also wants to describe humans as a type of creature, ceteris paribus, without oppression. This, like a lot of Ferrer's writing, is an extension of Marx's observations on the proletariat under capitalism, as opposed to the species being of humans, ceteris paribus, left to their own devices, all other things being equal. Ferrer is claiming that people work a certain way through the way that they communicate. Oppression, in whatever shape it takes, be it classrooms of death, Capitalism or authoritarianism prevents that certain way from taking place. Thus, oppression prevents the humanity of the oppressed. Likewise, it costs the oppressors their humanity as well. Pre-consciousness before conscientious is out, which is always social and never individual, since it's an extension of Marx's class consciousness. It should be obvious that it's by necessity a social function. Humans have to be social in order to be what we call human. I could probably set about 30 things here, but I doubt that should be necessary. Education, like people, is a being in the world and of the world and has a dialectical existence. Interviews with Contemporary Scholars Noam Chomsky, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA Please tell us about your background and current areas of expertise. Linguistics, Cognitive Science, Philosophy. What do you think Paolo Freire would say about how his theories are used today? I think he would be generally appalled by the current teach-to-test doctrines. What do you think a Freire in university would look like today? Instruction should reject the notion of education as pouring water into a vessel, in a phrase used in the Enlightenment, Freire's banking model. 
in favor of engaging students in an active quest for understanding in a faculty-student cooperative environment. To a significant extent, something like that is true of science teaching, at its best, sometimes elsewhere. If students took just one thing away from reading Pedagogy of the Oppressed, what would you hope it would be? They should recognize that education should be a process of self-discovery, of developing one's own capacities and pursuing interests and concerns with an open and independent mind, all in cooperation with others. Gustavo E. Fishman, Arizona State University, USA Please tell us about your background and current areas of expertise. I'm a professor of educational policy and director of EdExchange, the Knowledge Mobilization Initiative at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College, Arizona State University. I started to work in education as a popular educator in the early 1980s in Argentina without any formal training in either pedagogy or research. How did you come to read Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed for the first time? The first time I heard anything about Pedagogy of the Oppressed was not an invitation to read it, but an order to ignore it. In 1977, I was a 16-year-old studying industrial chemistry in a vocational school in Buenos Aires. I was not particularly politicized, but like everyone else in the country, I was acutely aware that we were living under a brutal dictatorship. It still makes me angry recalling how baffled I felt when the principal at my high school posted notes following the guidelines of the Ministry of Education announcing that the simple possession of any of the books on the list of immoral and dangerous readings was evidence of terrorist sympathies and reason enough to be expelled from the school. I remember that I became very curious that a book about education made it into this long list of dangerous books. Margot Okazawa Ray, San Francisco State University, USA, and Fielding Graduate University, USA. Please tell us about your background and current areas of expertise. My primary areas of work, teaching, research, and activism, focus on militarism, armed conflict, and violence against women. I've examined the connections between militarism, economic globalization, and impacts on local and migrant women in South Korea who live and work around U.S. military bases. I've conducted feminist activist research methodology training sessions with women activists in the Niger Delta region, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. I use popular education in community settings to conduct anti-racist and multicultural workshops and in my undergraduate and graduate courses. What do you think a Freirean University would look like today? Freirean University would be an oxymoron today. The forces of neoliberalism and conservatism that have engulfed most universities would result in the same harm being inflicted currently, irrespective of a name change. The most radical educational settings that could faithfully apply and advance Freire's work would be in informal settings, what I refer to as free spaces including activist movements, and within formal settings like universities, where we could learn and teach together as we face material and social conditions that are so heavily and horrifically shaping our lives, and recognize our shared destinies, oppressed and oppressor, dominant and subordinate, the vocal and the silent and silenced. Check, check, check. I didn't actually check that that was set up. Okay. Um, oh, it's going to wear a little hat. What's your head? Okay, now that we've heard what all of these scholars have had to say, let's talk about how we're going to use this. Okay, so conscientious as thou is the consciousness of oneself as a maker and knower in the world. People are, as humans, but are prevented from thinking that way by internalizing the oppression to which they are subject. Education is one of the many mechanisms by which that's done. And instructors act as intermediaries of that phenomenon, similar to the way that the lamps of old became soldiers to oppress the enemies of the state for a living. The way that conscientious is out is meant to be possible is by helping a person reach a state of consciousness of their role in the world to overcome that. 
to overcome the thinking of oneself as subhuman, thinking of oneself as an object to someone who is superior, to be able to engage critically, not just with ideas, but with their own ordinary lives and to use their consciousness of their own ordinary lives as the basis for the consciousness with which they will apprehend everything else, like literature, learning to read, and the things they're going to read. The interpersonal connection between the Brerin educator and the formerly oppressed individual is an exchange of identity. It's a conversation on a level where who a person is and what their place in the world is like becomes clear and becomes the basis for not just communication, but for teaching as well. And this is made very clear in Bassett and Warren. They talk about how this is the way to build up rapport and that the buildup of rapport gives people the humanity that they need in order for authentic education to exist and therefore authentic liberation and authentic humanity. When this happens, you can see changes in the way people see the world and the way in which they engage. There's a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, and a lot of positivity that Bell Hooks talks about a lot. Gannon said of teaching critical race history, the students liked the class better when he added diversity to the sources. They didn't just think that the class was more valuable because of token diversity. They didn't like it because they felt more like SJWs. They just generally liked the class and felt that they learned well according to the outcomes assessments compared to those of students before the change before increasing the diversity of the sources. They said that the experience was better, their enthusiasm was higher, and therefore the effectiveness of the education was better. The reason that this was accomplished was because Gannon stopped trying to teach diversity through white literature and started using diverse literature. Hooks also makes it clear that working with the privileged toward full integration into the social collectivity of the classroom improves the educational experience for all involved. In Freren terms, offering the people benefiting from oppression, even if they are unaware of it, the humanity that they are missing, acting indirectly in the role of the oppressor. This is Hooks' approach of radical openness. My lighting is blue and the shirt is blue and I really feel like this probably isn't gonna work out that well. Um, all right, home stretch. The banking model of higher education under neoliberal capitalism has left people aimless, uh, less hopeful, uh, poorly able to appreciate the value of education even when they get it. Okay, but we can deal with that. Using activities toward conscientious is out, we can learn about ourselves, each other, the social dynamics, and the effects of our pedagogy and society on us and vice versa. This can be fruitful in and of itself, and it may warrant reapplication. Um, it's important to, to talk about that because I'm not trying to sell the idea of Freire in education. I'm trying to show how it provides potential improvement for everything from the education taking place and the lives of those involved, but also society and the ongoing study and understanding of pedagogy itself. The results will lead to better general support for education educators by the educated. This will also help for support of social goods in general, like healthcare, meeting of the basic needs for people who don't have them, and of course, public universities. Ultimately, also, democracy and well-being of our society itself. When the population is better educated, society benefits. But here come the snags. Even if you can readily engage in meaningful pedagogy like Fawcett, Ward, and Hooks, there are challenges. There's efficiency to be considered, for example. One of the reasons why higher education is like this is because it's a lot easier for an institution to have one person in an auditorium surrounded by hundreds of students give a single lecture to all of them. It's a lot harder to do a lot of these kinds of things because you need to be in a position where you can have a reasonably small classroom with a limited number of people in charge. You can't do that with mass plenary conditions. Furthermore, students aren't prepared for it, which is another problem. Students have been prepared for standardized testing lecture test models. 
They're used to contextlessness. They just say answers. It doesn't matter what they mean or where they come from. They just have to be correct when they're asked about it. They are not used to communication with teachers, especially not on the level we're talking about. They aren't expecting it. In fact, they're used to being alienated in classes. It's like you keep your head down so you don't get embarrassed in class in high school and things like that. So we're already in a situation where to engage in this, you already have to fight against most of what the students take for granted is the norm, what it is they're expecting when they come into a classroom. They're not expecting to have you try to institute meaningful connections and produce conscientious is out. You're going to have to fight to make them see that they want to be here to learn at all. As Farah put it, to be whole people rather than the subhumans oppression has rendered them. The internalizing of oppression makes people act and feel and think this way. It's actually a major hurdle to get over that. And even then, it's much harder and more obviously socially risky, potentially embarrassing, and painful to do this sort of work compared to the kind of plannery garbage I was complaining about earlier. Bassett and Warren talk about a time when a student was harmed by their analysis of hate speech. Hooks found that she was treating a student inappropriately and overly harshly because she wasn't facing the fact that she was attracted to him. And Gannon shouldn't even be here. That's the thing. Bell Hooks started this sort of work, grew old, and died by the time Gannon wrote his book. Judging by the sources in Classrooms of Death, if anything, things have gotten substantially worse. Clearly something isn't working. I mean, the interviews that we heard earlier were from rock star academics from all around the world. And higher education is still a blistering inferno, twisting in a dumpster fire, centuries deep with filth. So what do we do? Now, for a long time on this project, and one of the reasons I'm so behind, was I didn't know. The best I could come up with was a hundred explanations for things that don't work and why they're not working. But there's work being done here at Oregon State University by Greg Walker. They've done a lot of work on climate change, communication, and sociology. Actually, there's a lot of climate change adjacent stuff happening here at Oregon State. The folks doing it don't seem to be networked or even know about each other. There's an irony in this section. A hot, steamy irony, ready to flatten. Anyway, I want to pitch a system called collaborative alignment. This is an approach used for community activism, engagement, and sociopolitical management usually of forestry land. It works by addressing four elements, the four Ps. Product, purpose, process, and of course, people. So you get a bunch of people together. Who's involved? Who's going to be affected? Who has their hands in these pies? Runs things? Who makes decisions? Who will be influenced? You get all of these people together into workshops. You get to know each other. You get to figure out how they're going to be able to communicate and work together. And then you discuss purpose. What is this for? What is it doing? Why? This has to be collaboratively explained, assessed, and agreed to. It also needs to be made clear that the purpose will avoid doing harm to people. Process. Uh, how is this going to be done? How will it be implemented? How will the powers that be that are involved react to the situation? What are people going to do? Finally, product. What's the outcome? What objectification may come of the activities? What in physical reality are we going to see or do or have that we do not have beforehand? Periodically, the knowledge havers and whatever authorities or representatives are involved need to check up to make sure that the alignment is good because all of this needs to stay together. The authors use motor vehicle alignment as a metaphor for this. When you're driving and your car starts to act funny, you know that there's something wrong and you have to fix the alignment. It's the same thing. You have to make sure that the balance of the four Ps stays consistent. But for us, I think I can do one better. You know those free spaces? How am I going to pronounce that? Marco Okazawa Ray. Oh, that's not that bad. I got to say thank you to anime though. Talked about in their interview we heard earlier. Well, what if these workshops weren't geographically located in a room or a school? Those interviews were from around the world. Now, theoretically, this approach is still possible, although 
Lampe Creative failed spectacularly. Literally, our YouTube channel is a spectacle of that failure. But I maintain that it could work. You'd need regular meetings in different times in different ways, almost certainly online. People can use remote location and learning technologies, which have been normalized since the 2020 lockdowns, to mitigate the geographic complications inherent in these sorts of projects. Now, it's still hard. Um, not only are classrooms and social groups in general better in person, um, it, it, I've even presented my own work on uh, addressing problems with Zoom-style classrooms as a thing. So we know that we're already dealing with an uphill battle here, but um, it, it could work. You could have these workshops operate on a semi-regular basis, but with fluidly designed times and dates. This is actually a really important part of collaborative alignment as an approach, because for our purposes, the way I'll put it is oppression tends to set standards that we operate within. So if a regular meeting time, day, and or place is inconvenient, then power sets the time for things, thus that the powerful benefit and the powerless stay powerless. Uh, then it's just in your best interests to pick a meeting time that works for everybody, which is going to be where the oppressors want you doing what's in their interest rather than meeting with the sort of people that need to be met with in order for this to have any meaning or create any real change. To ground that, for my example, I worked in restaurants, closing them down most of my adult life. People act like someone that wants to do things late at night or that isn't operating during the normal nine to five business hours is irresponsible, unrespectable, and lacking in merit. But nevertheless, they want someone to be there to serve them drinks and a steak dinner at 9 p.m. on Saturday nights. So there has to be somebody that doesn't fit that mold, that schedule. So yeah, there have to be variable times, variable days, and variable locations. Lots of reasons why that's important. Then we would have a collaborative organization with members all around the globe in cells of activism toward meaningful, humanizing, liberating pedagogy. Not one group, no. That leads to things like secret societies, smoke-filled back rooms, invitations to corruption, and a lack of transparency. There need to be several groups interconnected, interrelated, regularly working with different groups in these workshops, making and participating in workshops, all maintaining, participating in, and checking on the collaborative alignment in order to make sure everything is continuing to operate while the organization is working in tandem. That's how we fix this. There's a lot of other more direct practices or political goals, Newfield and Scarrett have those. I'm sure plenty of this leadership in the Frere and movement, like the people we've heard from in the interviews, contributed their own literature. And this would be a mechanism by which organized educational consortiums can reorient higher education into a pedagogy of radical hope and love. I was going to make a conclusion section, but I don't have time. This project is already huge and way overdue. And the time I've been working on it, I've struggled to keep my power on. My building's been under construction. There seems to be a fault in the audio hardware somewhere that I can't track down or fix. My video editing software was substandard when it was new seven years ago. Doesn't recognize my drivers now. Something bit my arm. That's what I was scratching earlier, and the mic picked it up, and I only noticed afterward. It got infected, and it's horrible. Anyway, uh, so I haven't had the time I would have wanted for a project like this, and it's ballooned as it is. So this just has to be done. It's a shame that it's not as engaging, entertaining, or clear as I'd hoped it would be. Upcoming on my works cited, uh, enjoy the music, and thank you for your time.